Another, there's another act in 1980 in California with the passage of Proposition 13. I mean, you may, you know, if you follow things on a national level, the educational system and, and public education system in California has been in an ongoing crisis for almost 30 years. That is a direct result of Proposition 13, which capped property taxes, which fund the schools. So all of this is really of a piece. And following upon this in the early 80s, we start, to, we start to see in the press a very, very comprehensive propaganda attack against the public schools. And this is probably most notably seen in a publication uh, that was put out by a federal commission in 1983 called A Nation at Risk. And A Nation at Risk really kind of sped up the, the acceleration of this campaign to essentially undermine public education and undermine the very notion of public education, in particular in the cities. Following upon a nation at risk, you start to hear about schemes to bring in private entities into public education. This initially starts really with what we know as vouchers, which was diverting public monies to private schools. But vouchers really kind of had a PR problem because it was such a brazen and bold and in-your-face attempt divert public money to public entities, that there was just a lot of resistance to it. So it never really, it never really quite gelled, and it never really quite worked. So following upon that, we had what is essentially what, what I like to call a, a corporate hijacking of another effort within the schools, something that started out essentially as an, an organic community-based and local-based effort, which were charter schools, which start out as efforts by parents and teachers to bring about needed reforms. Now, I don't think anyone in this room would probably argue with the fact that public education is in need of reform on many levels. It's a question of what those reforms are going to be and who's going to be putting those reforms into place. And I think that's, we're, we're here to change the terms of debate over how those reforms take place. We are often tried to be cast as, as opponents of reform. In fact, the people in this room are the real reformers. Because it's only through the activities of parents and teachers and peoples rooted in the communities that the schools serve that the schools can be truly reformed. And not by arrogant outsiders who have absolutely no, little or no experience in the classroom. So because of the bad PR that vouchers faced, the alternative was you have, you have these entities essentially in, 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 in largely but not entirely based on Wall Street, largely but not entirely based among finance capital, casting about for other vehicles to bring about the privatization of the schools. And they settled on charter schools, which again essentially began as a good faith effort to bring about local changes in the schools. But you started to have, you essentially had a hijacking of that movement. And so in the, in the past 10 to 15 years, they, charter schools, have become the vehicle for asserting private control, private, for-profit, and non-profit, which I'm going to put in quotes, because it's non-profit in name only, uh, private, uh, private for-profit, and non-profit, control of what should be and historically have been democratically controlled schools. And what we, what we see is, and what we're seeing today in, in really kind of an ever louder volume, which is now emanating from the White House as well, is a sort of a fever pitch that this campaign to both undermine the public schools and to impose charters as an alternative. And that's a direct imposition. I mean, this is not a process that is happening democratically. This is a process where the cities are the beachhead for the imposition of these private entities, and mayoral control is the vehicle by which these private entities are being put into control of the public school system and siphoning off resources from the public, public school system. So you will see that in that the communities where you have the largest number of private of charter schools are the communities that have mayoral control. And these are also communities where the, the, the democratic input into electing school boards has been taken away from communities. What we've also seen is the emergence of a very, very incestuous interlocking directorate of foundations 
academic departments, corporations, and educrats, opportunistic educrats, have, who have come together to put forward this campaign to privatize the schools. So you'll notice, so you have entities working on the public ground, lobbying such as groups such as uh, Democrats for Education Reform, you have new visions for new schools, you have the, um, yeah, you have the new, the, what's it, the new schools venture fund, and you'll notice that there's a tremendous amount of overlap and interlocking among the boards, not only of these entities, but these, you also, the same people who serve on the boards of these so-called philanthropies, which I prefer to call philanthropies, because they pretend to be acting in the service of society, whereas in fact their actions are reinforcing their own financial and economic interests. So the term I'd like to see be used is these people are philanthropists. Uh, so, but you will see a tremendous amount of overlap and interlock between the boards of charter schools, the foundations that are pushing them and funding them, that are publicizing them, the fact that you, it's almost impossible to open up the newspaper. If you looked at New York, the New York Sunday Times this week, you had a front page article about how to build a better teacher. And all of the expertise in that article, for example, apparently there are no public school teachers who can be interviewed about what makes successful and effective teaching in the classroom. And you had the person who was held up as the expert, a guy who they couldn't even, they couldn't even bring themselves to say how long he taught in the classroom. Right. The guy had a cup of coffee in the classroom. And he is somehow the one in the back of the room with a checklist determining the fate of teachers. All right? Which is really what, in, in the old days, in the old, under the old factory system, is what they used to call Taylorism, where they would do time and motion studies to see how long you could produce a widget. This is part of what we're seeing for the teachers in the room. This is part of what we're seeing also, is that all of us know the degree to which we are losing our professional autonomy. That article in the Times was a classic example of what is going to happen, of the way in which our professional autonomy is being taken away from us. Because that idea of building, notice, building a better teacher, we are the passive recipients of what these people are doing. And in a year or two or three, they will be in the back of our classrooms with their checklist. And if there aren't enough checks on that list, watch out. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably pretty close to being over, right? Right? So at, at any rate, I mean, I just wanted to come on. No, I know. We can listen to you all night. Other people think yes, but other but we need to hear about very specific struggles that are going on in these communities because in many ways that's much more important. So, I mean, I hope that gives kind of a rough outline of what's going on. Any other questions later, if you'd like to talk to me afterwards, I'll, I'll talk all night. Thank you. Thank you.